Thank you. I, I, I'm listening to, to everyone talking, and my head was actually moving and, and thinking back of what, uh, uh, how we worked back uh, at home. I, I want to start by saying that not usually the reason why we demand accountability is because we don't have trust. There is a lack of trust. People don't trust each other, and that's the reason. And one other thing that I, 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 I want to say is that you can't buy trust. Neither can you successfully impose it. So I believe that uh, uh, to, to get accountability or, or, or to get trust, you need to foster it through a sense of responsibility, shared responsibility. I agree with some of my colleagues when we said, first things first, you need to know what is it that you want to achieve together? Where do we want to go? What is it that we want to achieve together? And then it has to be very clear because uh, uh, normally you're talking about the recipients and, and the givers. And very often the givers are in a different scale and the recipient in a, in a, is in a different uh, uh, stage of development. And that applies to your knowledge, your skills, etc. So very often you don't understand each other. You are talking like this, across purpose. So you need to kind of break it down. Those nice, beautiful goals that we talk about, it needs to be broken down to see if we can have a, an understanding of exactly what is it that we want to do together. And the road to get there. How difficult is it? How easy is it? The context, the departing point. So the giver must try to understand that. And that takes a lot of work. That takes a lot of patience. And, and, and takes that you really need to do that. And then another thing that I want to say also is both sides need to understand their roles and responsibilities. So that whatever action I do, doesn't create suspicions from the other side. I, I have a very interesting uh, uh, experience uh, recently. When I say recently, it's been like the last four years when I was trying to reform my own ministry back in Timor-Leste. I myself was educated in Australia, so I'm coming with at a different level. And then there I am with all these public servants. And you know, I come with the goals, targets, etc. And I had an assumption that they understood. Let me just give you an example of uh, when I was, I was trying to break down the tasks that we needed to do to get to the goals that we, needed, that we had agreed upon. And then uh, uh, we started to talk about contract management. And so I said, looks like we don't have anybody that is responsible for contract managing here. They go, yes, minister, we do, this person. I said, Really? What level is he? And he was very low. I said, go, go and call him over here. I want to ask him, what does he do with all, this, with all these contracts? Because we were not paying the people. So I asked him, what, how do you manage this contract? He goes, well, I, I received the contract, I photocopied, and I filed it. So I've managed the contract. And I go, oh my God, no wonder we were not paying those companies because the contract has been filed. Nobody was monitoring anything. So I had to explain to them that is not what contract management is all, is all about. So my people didn't even have a concept about it. They didn't understand. So I had to go through this process. So you apply that at a whatever level, national level, international level, whatever. And, and I like that the, uh, the question about the MDGs, the lessons that we've learned. From me, I would say the minimum is I better understand what it is, those goals. We didn't know what MDGs were, and how in the whole world am I supposed to implement something that I don't know anything about? And I used to have this argument with the UN, because I, in my country, it seemed that the UN thought MDGs were theirs. Until one day I said, hang on, MDG is about me, about us. So the secretariat should be with me, not you. I should be writing those books. I should be monitoring this because it's about me. Because if you do it there, 
I don't own it. I am not responsible for that. So, and this changed our behavior, made me more responsible for it because it was about us. So I don't know how you uh, uh, interpreted that and, and try to change the systems, but that is what needs to be done on the ground at the end of the day. Um, another thing is, okay, you, you, we understand each other, we are moving on, and then you fail. Somebody fails. The first reaction is to penalize. I learned something else. I said, I'm, I don't penalize with my directors. I go and try to find out why is it that you failed? What was it? Did you have enough resources to do the work? Then I find out they didn't have it. So when we set up goals, etc., and expectations, we also need to understand, do they have, have we given enough resources? And this is another thing, my own experience back in 1999 when the country was burning and everything, the international community was like, everybody was wanting to help Timor-Leste. And I didn't even have a house to stay in because everything was burnt. Everybody else had the house. I had to fight some NGOs, international NGOs, and said, come on. Shanana, who was supposed to be the leader, was in the mountains because we didn't have a house. Everybody took all those houses. How do you expect to have meetings with us? We don't even have a chair. We don't even have a table. I don't even have a car to take me from point A to point B. How am I supposed to go and guide you? Because nobody wanted to invest in that. Nobody wants to invest in infrastructure. But they want to invest in the soft stuff. And how can I do the soft stuff if I don't have the conditions for it? So what does it mean? It means understanding again. So I, I was thinking as I was listening to everybody, you know the best thing we should do is change shoes, change roles. Then we know what does it take. For me, it was an experience because I was actually working for the World Bank, for the UN, and then suddenly I became the Minister of Finance and I had to go on to their shoes and that's when I struggled and that's when I actually learned and, and because of my own background, then I fought back and I started to try to convince my development partners back home that, hang on, do you trust me? Am I making up stories now? I want to succeed. Everybody wants to succeed, who doesn't? So depart from that point. And, and this takes me to whoever asked about the South-South, Guinea-Bissau, for example. Guinea-Bissau, everybody, whatever they did, so what did the, do we do as an international community? We sanction it. We don't go and help, we stop everything. But then we say to them, provide a legitimate government through elections. But nobody wants to help them with elections. How in the whole world are they going to do it? They were desperate. They went everywhere asking for help. People didn't want it. Lucky when they came to Timor and my prime minister, who's such a, because he's gone through so much, and he says, no, we will help you. So we went out there and helped to even get equipment in one of those countries that were sanctioning Guinea-Bissau. We had to move, buy those equipment, take it to another country, hire an aeroplane, take those equipments to Guinea-Bissau just to do that election so that everybody could recognize the legitimate government. How can you expect something and don't provide the resources? But now, once the election is done, it's successful, everybody now wants to associate with it. Like, come on, be serious. I, I don't want to offend anybody. But that is what is wrong with the international community. We are, we've lost the sense of human being, the compassionate sense, the understanding. We've lost it. We just go back to the basics. Touch, okay, it's red, so I have to stop. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh,